And now it is my honor to introduce Elena Gonzalez Blanco as our guest speaker today. Elena is a highly regarded artificial intelligence and digital innovation expert. Uh, she has a special focus on the impact of language technologies on applications in industry. Recently, she was appointed as global head of digital for wealth management and insurance at Banco Santander and research director at the IE Business School in Madrid. She holds a PhD in Spanish philology and was awarded first national MA prize in Spanish studies and classics. She further developed researching and teaching activities at Harvard, King's College, UNAM, Bonn and UNED. Elena knows how to combine business and research activities. In both sectors, she currently has numerous positions and she has had more positions and received more recognitions and prizes than I have time to recite. So check her biography on the conference website. Let me just mention that she holds positions of trust in several committees and boards, both in Spain and at European level. Among those positions, she's been a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of CLARIN, a committee that reports to the CLARIN General Assembly. And it is in this capacity that I got to know her quite well during my time on the executive board of Claire. And I've always been impressed by her constructive input that allows us to improve the Claire infrastructure. So today, Elena will talk to us about the impact of AI and language technologies in particular on the entertainment sector through applications such as recommender systems. Elena, the digital floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Conrad. So it's really a great pleasure to be here today. And it's a, a great honor uh, to be here, not only in, in Claren Conference, but especially with uh, friends and colleagues that uh, it's a long time since we met in, in person. So let me share my screen. Okay, fantastic. So, well, first I, I wanted to thank you for the invitation. It's uh, really a, a pleasure to be here. And that's a thing that I was telling yesterday to my husband. I could not imagine that this would happen five years ago. So thanks, Francisca, Monica, <clears throat> all the Clarence Steering Committee and everyone that has organized the conference because I'm really impressed year and year by the quality and the, the improvement that we are seeing, uh, even that if I have lived from inside, but it's uh, it's amazing how Clarence is growing and how things are improving. The second thing I wanted to tell you is that I would have loved that this conference would have taken place in Madrid. The pandemic hasn't let us to this to happen for two years, but I think that it will happen soon in the near future. So I continue welcoming you here and hoping that at some point we will have to celebrate this in person with a good tortilla de patata and a good tapas here. So, okay, so as Conrad uh, told uh, about me, that was too generous, but I am a, a person that has started a career in the academia working with uh, linguistics, language technology, and have evolved to the industry. And I wanted to give you today my personal view on how this evolution has taken place with real data and real projects, because I think, and this is a thing that we have commenting for a long time already, that the opportunity of language technologies and language infrastructure and language research, it much far beyond the academy. And it has a great application in the industry. And we haven't even started to see how this is impacting in real time our society. And we have a real great role to play here. But I don't want to talk about theory. I want to, to be very practical from the point of view of my experience. And that's why I want to thank you about music, poetry, and how this is impacting the industry and how technology has moved to this area. Let me start. Well, you probably remember this music, which is <clears throat> not only a very well-known song, but it's also a very important poem that was created some time ago. When you ask people what's this, they will probably remember about the music composed by Karl Off, 
uh, a composer from the 30th year of the 20th century. But the letters, the songs, the lyrics uh, are coming from the poems from the 12th century, what were composed by the Goliardic medieval monks and found in the monastery of Benedict Boyan. This is only one of the examples of poetry and music that were famous and were lasting across the different years and have taken us to a moment where the world is changing a lot and where music and entertainment has a lot to do with poetry and text. Let me explain you why. Well, machine learning and artificial intelligence have changed the entertainment habits today with the phenomena of streaming and personalized entertainment, which is growing very, very fast through this different platform. Video is the most popular streaming format, but there are also different formats and music is one important streaming transformation way of uh, perceiving our entertainment, which is growing every day. Platforms are multiplying and differentiating content by specializing in specific type of users. As we can see, for example, the phenomenon of Netflix, we perceive that recommendations are more and more focused on users and are becoming very dynamic. We can see that every day recommendation system changes. And if you try to analyze why and how these systems are working, they become more and more complex. We also have really schedules that change every day to create tension and to create expectations in users that are receiving different type of contents. We are more open to non-English materials, to more specialized content, to documentaries, to series, and to specific contents that were very strange before these times. The entertainment providers are trying to innovate every day, and they are trying to bring different type of generations on board. So for example, this nostalgic approach to bring uh, people from the 80s to the new screens, are using strategies like taking characters that were popular when we were kids. So these stream platforms are trying to focus on different population segments to their content through different strategies. For example, millennials that are reviving the 80s or niche streaming series that are trying to catch people that have different type of hobbies. And of course, mobile are more and more important. So we are getting used to shorter and quicker materials, <clears throat> which are about 25% of this global streaming, which is happening over mobile data networks. They need faster compressions and the really delivery technologies because we don't want to wait. We don't want to wait and we want to go fast, quick, and with a good quality. So videos are getting with a better quality and technology is evolving a lot to compress them in a, in a better way to improve the user experience. We have perceived that mobile traffic is increasing over 40%. And one important point is the relevance of music in this new experimentation, which is getting more and more important in apps like TikTok, which is based on video music, but also to other social networks like Instagram or Twitch that are getting more video effects with music and with the lyrics more and more. So the audience is distributed across different tools and ages, but what is clear is that the trend is increasing and growing faster and more and more. This has been a specific important phenomenon during pandemic time because of COVID impact. As you already know, this uh, convergence of new technologies, internet penetration, expanding mobile usage, and ubiquitous lockdowns are driving forces behind this development. These two years have been transforming all the entertainment area and TV and video consuming has increased over 40%, which is huge. So in that sense, music has also grown a lot in terms of how consumers are changing the habits of uh, listening to music, listening to radio, radio uses are decreasing a lot and music streaming traffic has grown by 20%. It has been led by Spotify and Apple Music during the pandemic, but the fact that accessibility and convenience have been crucial factors, <clears throat> they have increased the growth of this streaming segment. This success <clears throat> is mainly based on the tailor-made playlist 
that they offer to users based on their listening. These playlists are replacing traditional albums and have a different way of giving the information to consumer, which was, of course affects to the data and how these playlists are built. But before entering into how these playlists are based, let's look at the numbers <clears throat> from the business perspective. So if we look at this market, now we have 400 million of music subscribers, which is huge and growing in a very fast way. We see that Spotify is the standard leader in terms of subscribers with 20, 32% of market share. Amazon is growing faster than Apple, even if Apple is bigger now, but probably the trend will change in a, let's say, short period of time. What is also very surprising is that Tencent Music Entertainment it uh, has taken the first spot with 11%. And remember that this is very impressive because this is almost entirely referred to China and this accelerating growth that has added 14 million subscribers just in Q2 2020 compared to the 6 million that they had last year. So the growth in Asia and in China is amazing in terms of music recommendation systems. Google is also growing very fast <clears throat> because YouTube Music has... Uh, made Google this uh, find to find this place in the in the music space. And what's particularly interesting about this state of the global market uh, is that we are starting to see segmentation taking place, which is a great achievement given that most of the services have to operate with the same catalog and pricing. So for example, we see that YouTube music is uh, resonated with uh, Generation Zeta and younger millennials, or Amazon music is bringing older audiences to subscriptions, and Spotify and Apple music are mainstream options, while Deezer is enjoying the success in emerging markets like Brazil with prepaid mobile money. So business models are different, audiences are different, but it's, what is clear is that the market is growing and the trend will continue in the same way. And I wanted to give a focus on especially on, on Latin music which is growing even faster than the rest of the market. So the annual growth rate is almost 6% with 70 million users by 2024, 60% yearly growth. And if we look, for example, at the top songs in Spotify, we see that half of the top 20 songs are in Spanish with an increase of 10% of market set. So I don't want to give more numbers, but the most important here is that we are seeing, for example, that there is a trend of becoming more and more variation in terms of language, in terms of uh, trends, and in terms of types of music, that it's much far beyond the standard and needs to be specialized. And why I am referring to this in this language resources conference, in this clearing conference, talking about music and about recommendation? Well, this is very important and it's strongly related to, to lyrics of the songs because to build those lists and to fit them into the user preferences, music streaming providers have developed software tools and technique called recommendation system, which apply big data and machine learning to the large amounts of data collected from the users to provide personalized suggestions. So the same as Spotify, as Netflix does with the videos, Spotify does that with music. But the question here is, how do all these recommendation system works? Because recommenders are built based on three main strategies, similarities between songs that are identified by the sound waves, collaboration targeted by users. So if I am listening to music and I tag them the song with a laugh or beats or something like that, these tags are collected and used to provide the users similar recommendation to my behavior or to my preferences, which is a classical way of recommending users, users like you like this kind of songs or the sounds that I'm listening are recommended to users that have been categorized with a similar profile of mine. And there is also the classification using conventional tag for songs based on metadata such as cover name, composer, teacher, title, or genre, which is a, a big issue because there are, as you know, many different classifications of genre, of cover, beat, tempo, pitch, instrument, mood, usually uh, tags and items that have to see a lot with music and with musical uh, types of uh, categorizing songs which is interesting, but 
if we see that there are very few tools that currently offer a set for the lyrics of the song. So the lyric of the song is the letter that the poem has beyond the music. There are very few tools that are taking into account this. And those who do not take here to take account the, 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 the song, the, the lyric, they just are using the literal text and do not make a deeper analysis on the meaning or search capabilities based on the semantics of the lyrics. They are just looking for words or just looking for general topics, but don't use them as a deep dive into the classification system or to blend to the content to extract more information. We have a few examples of tools that are in the market that are using a little bit of lyrics to offer a premium search functionality or a recommender system. So for example, Shazam, which is based on a sound wave, does not allow to use search by lyrics. It only has some information store about songs like artists or genre, and just shows the items that have similar characteristics. Spotify does not allow searching for lyrics, although the recommendation includes uh, some basic metadata. Soundhouse allows users to sing a cappella song as a search part for the lyrics using a test search engine, uh, but it also overlooks the use of lyrics to my recommendation. Race Note is another song recognition service that also makes recommendation, but although it had a lot of metadata, its recommendations are not based on the content of the lyric. And Genius is a service used by companies like Apple that it's dedicated to song lyrics and recommends and gathers the, the song lyric segments and offers additional context, such as information on how the song was devised or explanation about the meaning of verses. And it has a great potential, but it has not been exploited yet in terms of natural language processing or language technologies applied to the content of the, of the song of the lyrics. But what's behind all this? So none of all these recommendation systems take into account the semantic information of the song lyrics. Lyrics are much more than that. They are formed by text using usually the form of poetry. And the information retrieval of this knowledge by applying natural language technologies and language technologies is a great source of information that can be used to enhance the recommendation system by opening and explore possibilities for the music market which are not being used yet. So for example, we have automated topic detection, inappropriate topics for age groups or racial and gender message. So we, when we open a playlist, we see that the content is not recommended for specific age, but this is usually done in a manual way and in a very rough way of, of recommendation. So you don't have specifications or reasons or similar contents or, or things like that. And there is a big room for improvement there. And there is also a, another problem, which is that unfortunately, not all language and poetic traditions have received equal attention in terms of developing automatic tools for poetry, with English being overwhelmingly overrepresented and with modern attempts in other languages as a German, or French, or Spanish, and of course, many other languages that we are seeing in, in Europe that we see from the research point of view and from the language technology perspective that are underrepresented uh, in research, but even more underrepresented when we go to commercial tools that are using technology for analyzing songs or lyrics or poetry or text. So, in this situation and in this panorama, we try to do, to do something for understanding Spanish poetry, Spanish songs. And this started with a post-data project that was an ERC project that I became uh, five years ago. And we were trying to organize this uh, poetic tradition infrastructure in Europe. We started by understanding poetry, to compare tradition, to trying to create a standardized tool to understand the metrics, the semantics, and the uh, emotional and sentimental relationship between poems. And we realized that the same thing that you can do with poems, you can do with song lyrics, because actually there are poems behind those songs and the things that we generate, the metadata and the information that we can generate can go much farther beyond poetry to music songs in order to improve this recommendation system that I mentioned before. So 
what we got after the five years of uh, strong research by combining semantic web technologies, natural language processing, uh, machine learning tools, and testing a lot of different things was a laboratory that we like to call like that, a poetry lab, where we have different kinds of tool sets and, and research experiments that have helped us to understand the essence of poetry. And now we are working on how to apply these results into the lyric songs in order to be able to bring these results beyond research into the industry. So if I look at Poetry Lab now, I have to say that it's a marketplace for natural language processing tools devoted to poetry analysis techniques insofar as literary phenomena that really rely on linguistic traits and work on metrics, stylistics, and semantics. And I'm gonna give you a very quick overview of some of the most, let's say, highlight tools that you can see in a more detail in, in the website and we can comment or discuss in a further detail uh, at some point, because of course there is a, a lot of room for improvement yet. But for example, we have created or we have a work stream on metrical analysis and scansion. We have created a tool that we call Rant and Plan, which is a, a Python library for the automated scansion of Spanish poetry. Uh, it's also able to identify up to 45 different types of the most significant Spanish stanza. And it's fast and accurate as it is built using spacey and spacey uh, fixes. Um, in that sense, we have also experimented with neural network models that are using a word verse approach with minimal natural language processing in the traditional way. So we have also used BERT model to train a scansion system. And we have compared the different way of using a scansion with traditional natural language processing tool and with BERT and transforming model to train them. And we have got interesting results that are far beyond the state of the art when they are applied to poetry. But this is not the only thing that we have done. Of course, corpora are very important. And as you know, corpora are the, the cornerstone of what we do after that. And our first problem was to find a, a poetic corpus. And after that, the poetic corpora, some corpus to train our system and to test if our systems are working. So we created a library, which is a Python library and a command line interface to download and standardize corpora from 10 multilingual poetry repositories in different formats into a single representation that could be downloaded uh, with an annotated corpus to reconcile with TIAI entities to provide a unification output. And we uh, obtain the data in JSON and then uh, we convert and correspond to some of the data properties for the post data ontology. So we have created an ontology to classify all the information for poetry because the starting point of the project was to how to create a common language for poetry, how to unify semantic web technologies and control vocabularies to uh, communicate the different poetry tradition across the different language based on the standards, of course, because we know how important it is to share information and to use the standards for all the things that we do. And we have created these three ontologies, post data core, poetic analysis, and transmission that are free and available because they have been already published, combined with the FRBR, OO, and ODP ontologies, and with a layer of control vocabularies that we have combined with the corpora and the tool sets to be tagged with the ontology in order to make the information flow across the different applications. So, one of the things that we have already been experimenting and working with is similarity tools with uh, neural networks. So we have created what we call Alberti to, to play with Bert and, and with Alberti, with the writer in Spanish, which is a set of two bert based multilingual models for poetry, a model trained on single verses and a model trained on stanzas. And uh, we have uh, open a repository on high in face that it's open and available. And here we have a, a nice example of uh, how we can change the final words of uh, a poem into similar words that can allow users to play with similarities, but also with contents and to improve the semantic approach if we want to be more creative from a computational perspective. And uh, in that sense of similarity, uh, what we wanted to get is uh, a recommender for similar songs based only on the content of the lyrics. So here is, uh, we have what we have called Dalton, 
which is an interface when we can put a song there and you get similarity based on space information or based on Spotify recommended information and based on the corpus where we are looking for, we can get similar song based uh, on vectors and uh, embeddings to get similar text based on these uh, ways of uh, classifying and analyzing similar text by similarity metrics. So. Those are ongoing tools what we are improving and we are trying to, let's say, adjust not only for Spanish, but also for different languages. But the idea is just not to give all this information to papers and journals, and we have done uh, always, but to go one step further and to use all these results of research to enrich the music market recommendation system. So we have created a Poetry Lab API, which is a REST API that provides an analysis endpoint to extract all the information about the poems. And uh, at this point, we have three methods supported, a scansion to extract information, and jamben to check the, the jamben of lines, and naming to recognition for text. But we will include the tools that I have shown you uh, in a regular process. So the idea is that this thing can be enriched with the time and with the uh, open tools because everything that we have done we have published and we have free in order to enrich the conversation around algorithms for understanding poetry but the uh, results or the output of this project has been a proof of concept that we are working now in which is the lyrics project which is uh, because of the works artificial intelligence for lyrics for these lyrics of the songs that as i told you is not more than poetry, but the purpose of this project is to build an APIs recommendation engine, so a web service APIs for some way to enrich the potential of existing using recommendation system. So we want to go far beyond research because there is a big gap in terms of music industry, which is understanding the song lyric in different languages, which is a thing that almost nobody is using at this point. So we want to do it in an automated way to automate generate metadata extracted from the lyric analysis to enrich the recommendation system without the need of manual tagging and with the manual uh, corpora uh, supervision that it's doing up to now. So this is, as I told you, only one example on how artificial intelligence and natural language processing algorithms is applying to Spanish music. And it will improve the existing algorithms by providing them with new training data and uh, the intelligence performance in Spanish, making it more human and better prepared for part of the projects in other areas. But as I told you at the beginning, I don't want to leave this only to music because the opportunity in language technologies is so huge at this moment from the commercial point of view, from the industrial point of view, and from the market point of view that what we want to bring here today is not the case of music, is the sense of opportunities that we have at this moment, the sense of urgency that we have in the market, where we have the knowledge, we have the infrastructure, we have the training, and we have the know-how and how to make things and how to make things well, but we need to go far beyond research and to transmit this knowledge to our community in order to make the right with the, with language technologies outside research. And just to give you some examples, we see that there are chatbots everywhere. And if you analyze how commercial chatbot works, most of them are not working well at all. They have a very rudimentary rule-based model that are even not using natural language processing or machine learning system. We have also a great opportunity in medical records, understanding in documentation for uh, understanding what customers need and how customers is communicating with the doctor that has not been even analyzed for understanding how we can improve medicine. There is a big, big room for improvement in banking, in fintech and insurance where I'm working now. And believe me, I didn't have any idea about insurance or banking before I came into this world a couple of years ago. So it's a matter of how these language technologies are evaluated. And there are a lot of documents, contract, mortgage documentation, fraud detection tools that need to understand how we speak and what's language processing and how we can extract information for these big amounts of data that had not been looked at before. Because 
they are saying that we want to have an omni-channel approach for the customer, but this omni-channel approach is, is now at the PowerPoint that it's not happening yet because we don't have the technology in place, which is working really well as we need, specifically for language, which is the big challenge of artificial intelligence now. In energy, for example, you could not imagine that this is a sector that it's using increasing natural language processing and, and language technologies and voice technology to offer customized info for clients to understand where customers are speaking or which kind of uh, green energy we want to, to develop or a phenomena like connected car when we need to be understood by the car and to give instruction and to uh, interact technology and connect different sources of data everywhere with a big infrastructure. And of course, the pending point that I always mention is legal documentation. Legal area is far beyond technology in a lot of senses, not only from the documentation point of view, which is a great opportunity there, but also from the regulation point of view, where we are facing now, and especially in Europe, a challenge in terms of things that we can do and we cannot do with data for users, with sharing data, GDPR, and all these things, where we have a lot of say from the technology perspective and from the uh, use of data perspective, because we know what we are doing, and most of the people doesn't. But there are some challenges, uh, just to finish there, which are how we can tackle all these uh, points. First challenge is language. I gave you the example of uh, Latin music with uh, 400 million of users and 500 million of speakers. But what we are seeing now and we see from the research perspective and from the industrial perspective is that in spite of the volume of sign language in the world, there is a different way of uh, using language resources across different languages. And especially in Spanish, which is the case that I, I better know, we have also different variations across uh, the different countries in Latin America and language technologies have not yet there. So we have done something, but we need to do much more in terms of improving the existing system and to bring them to the market in terms of the really making artificial intelligence work as, as people try to sell. Of course, the other challenge is uh, infrastructure. The infrastructure is a thing that doesn't exist in the industrial world. So there are big companies that are trying to, uh, let's say, be present in the market and to make everyone use the, the same infrastructure. But we need to work on uh, data. We need to work on standardization. We need to work on the concepts of infrastructure. And we will need to bring the lessons learned from clearing, outside clearing, and to explain what we have done and how things are working can be uh, reused or uh, trained for other people that are working with industrial infrastructures because they are just about to start building data lakes and trying to share information and create a standard. And I think that there are a lot of things that we have been working since 10 years ago that need to be transmitted to other areas beyond research. Of course, for this, we need to do a lot of dissemination. So the initiatives that we are doing, the ambassadors, the talks, the everything that we are doing is not enough. We need to do more and we need to do more outside the, the research work. And I think this is the only way of connecting people and making people aware on where, where the challenges of AI and language technologies are. And of course, as I told you, regulation and where we are in Europe and how we want to make this grow with us and not in spite of us, it is also very, very important. So this is just the beginning of this new adventure. Even if we are working more than 10 years in Clarion and we have created infrastructure and we are starting to see that there is uh, something to, to show to the world, there is a lot that has to be created, that has to be shown to the world that is still under the water. So now it's important to give the big step. And as Forbes announced that natural language processes and language technologies in 2021 is one of the trending topics to grow in technology and artificial intelligence, we need to be there because we need to show the world what that what we have done in clearing is much more important and relevant that people think so as martin miminski said if robots inherit the earth we are the parents and we need to be there for the big next transformation and i encourage you to join the adventure 
and to show the world that clearing is much more than a research infrastructure and a tool for gathering corpora or for connecting people. So thank you very much. And yeah, I'm open to questions. I'm happy to share my own experience with a coffee whenever you want, and hopefully for the next time that you will be here in Madrid. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you for a very inspiring talk uh, that uh, really um, gives us a lot of ideas about uh, how in the future we will engage with uh, intelligent systems, not just through this little uh, device here, but in cars and all over. Um, it, I, it, I, I think this is a great subject for discussion. So I hope there will be some, some raised hands. Um, so please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Meanwhile, I want to ask you the following. Um, let me tell you that I currently am participating in a Norwegian national project about um, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, responsible news. And also in the news sector, there is a lot going on with uh, recommender systems and the analysis of news uh, and, and social, um, social interaction tied to the news. And one of the big problems that people have spotted, uh, especially in relation to uh, fake news, is the trustworthiness of, of the information uh, and also the bias that is in, uh, in recommender systems. So have you come across problems with, um, let us say, um, lack of trustworthiness and bias in the domains that you were working in? Yes, of course, this is one of the topics that is becoming recurrently one of the questions that people are asking about. And especially when people are far from uh, language technologies and they don't understand very well, the first the two things that they ask is data privacy, ethics and bias. So those are the favorite topics. And in countries like Spain, whenever we talk about AI, we are talking about ethics. So that's uh, amazing. But uh, I think it's, it's very important to teach people how these things working. And especially with the, with the bias thing, it's very important to explain people how we train data, how we work with corpus, how we uh, train algorithms to reproduce what we see in the data. And to understand that bias are not in the algorithms, that bias are in the data, and we are not conscious of that until we train them. So it's a good exercise to tell the story in a reverse way and to explain how technology is not biased, technology is not dangerous, technology is not uh, something to be afraid of, but it's just a, a reflect on how humans are behaving. So the most important thing here are just to give some examples that are easy to understand for those people. So uh, if we look in the internet for executive, we see a man dressed in a black suit. If we look for clean, a cleaning the, that is usually ladies appearing, and that's not artificial intelligence. Those are the pictures that we upload to the internet. So with these kind of examples, we need to explain people in a very clear way that training algorithms is so important as having a good data source uh, to be used to train them. And, and I think that's uh, simple to understand, but it's the starting of education to these uh, communities that don't understand what's an algorithm and how to train that. I'm sure the discussion of uh, bias will not uh, stop here, but there is a question from Andrea Switz. Yes, a question, uh, but first of all, I have a big thank you. Thank you, Elena. It was a great presentation and very inspiring. Um, I was especially uh, uh, fascinated by the fact you mentioned about the legal system and the legal sector and translating or uh, national language processing for this sector, because I think this could be a very interesting um, case for Clarin, because in Europe, we do have uh, 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 different legal systems. We have different languages. The legal system is expressed in language. And this data is um, essentially free uh, by law. So everybody can use it. Um, do you have, um, and now my question, do you have any particular um, um, 
applications. Uh, for instance, I could imagine a, a, a kind of a search system for the legal systems for lawyers uh, that is possible, but also for the public administration or uh, the glam sector. Do you have any uh, uh, ideas or uh, something you work on in this field? Thank you. Yes, so uh, as I told you, this is one of the topics that is worrying me more from the point of uh, view of uh, how we can advance in, in Europe. Because on the one side, we see and we have heard that the uh, United States sometimes is inventing technology, China is copying and Europe is regulating. And this is like that. So the legal, uh, the legal problem is to fall it. On the one side is regulation. We are trying to uh, over-regulate uh, a lot of things about data, and this is sometimes uh, good because it's great to be aware of uh, the dangers and everything, on sharing information, on leaks and, and everything. Of course, I fully agree with that. But the problem is that sometimes some regulations are impacting the way in which we can train data, share data, and uh, grow in terms of uh, training technologies or making infrastructures available for everyone, for example. In the case of clearing, we are using uh, data that are usually free and are used for research, but when we go to the industry where we have a lot of regulators uh, which are different across the different countries. So, in the last two years, I was working on launching a platform for selling insurance online across the different countries in Europe. And I spent more time with legal departments than with technology teams. Huh. And that's terrible. First of all, because usually when you are talking to legal teams, they don't understand what technology and what are you doing. They are just reading uh, regulations that are usually published later and uh, in a, let's say, not so clear way. And things are based on interpretation on the person that you are talking about on how to find a way of make things without uh, changing the, the regulation or without violating the rules. So this is time consuming and, and energetic consuming. And I think it's very, very important that uh, we also are present in the uh, regulation decisions in the European commissions for natural language technologies or for data and for everything, because they need people that really understand how technology work. And sometimes regulations are made without the knowledge of uh, us, which is very, very important. And on the other side, for me, the opportunity in, in the legal area is the, the legal uh, sector itself. So we have technologies like blockchain or, or NLP or machine learning to understand contracts and to verify information and to uh, compare documents. But what we really see in our real world is that people continue to have lawyers to read documentation, to discuss about documents and to compare documents and, and everything. So they are losing so much time in things that machine can do for us that it's really a pity. I mean... <laughs> I think that we need to train and to educate people and to work on the, on the really knowledge, but we need to automatize a lot of tasks. So when people talk about the AI telling that uh, we are making jobs disappearing, so I think that they are part of some jobs like um, reading documentation and writing documentations for legal sector that need to be done by a machine. And this is a thing that uh, we need to do, but we need to train and to work a lot together with the legal teams. And what I've seen is that legal and technology are still far in terms of collaboration and probably this is a way of working with uh, governments or with uh, special interest groups in that in, in several countries to work on, on legal staff and to try to help them with our language technologies to improve how they understand our topic and how we can improve their jobs. Great. Um, Thank you a lot. You mentioned that um, uh, some companies uh, do not provide access to the lyrics of the songs. Um, more generally, would you say it is more difficult to obtain data from industry than from the research and, and academic sector? Yes, that's one of the big problems that we have for a natural language processing or for artificial intelligence uh, beyond research. So, when we go for uh, uh, trying to see what's going on on banking or insurance, we don't have corpora. We don't have corpora to work at. I, I was trying to do something for Spanish insurance documents. We have to build our own corpora because it doesn't exist. Companies have documents, companies have data lakes, but they don't share anything. And what usually happens is that, let's say, companies, the companies that are working with uh, those uh, 
banks or insurance companies, they use them to train their systems with and to train their algorithms with the data because uh, there is not the philosophy of sharing data or creating a common infrastructure that we have now. And I think this is a well, this is a pity in terms of imagine that we could use a similar infrastructure uh, to the one that we have in Clarin just for uh, fintech or for insurance or for legal, and we could have uh, more corporate to experiment with them in the, in the different areas. When we look at the results, we are just having something for medicine. We are having something for European documentation and everyone is picking up the same documentation or social network analytics to train the system. And I think there is a big gap. And there is a big gap also uh, in the different languages because uh, if we go then to German or to French or to uh, Russian, uh, there is still less uh, in terms of what we can do from, from the perspective of training libraries and creating systems for understanding our own language. So for me, this is a, an obvious spending system and we should try to join forces and to create some artificial intelligence for banks from a, a research perspective, let's say. Yeah, so it seems like uh, it's about time to include industry in, uh, in our... Um, group of organizations that provide data. There is a final question from Eduardo Sanchez. Please unmute. Um, I have a question regarding the, the, the post data application, the, the post data project. I see that you are, uh, from, from, from what I saw, that you're developing a some sort of uh, language independent uh, poetry ontology, but uh, my question is whether this uh, language ontology would, uh, is, this poetry ontology is merely uh, dedicated to prosodic elements, to more uh, syntactic elements, or it, it also goes into the semantics of the, of the different uh, poetry in different languages. Is it, it it started with the with the metrical and, and the semantic part because the idea and the origin of the project was to try to standardize uh, and to communicate the different models across the different poetry databases in Europe. So what we did is we took the, the databases that we knew that were working on poetry and we built a, a common data model to understand the categories and the uh, let's say the tags that they were using for classifying metrics, for classifying semantics, for classifying every kind of thing that was related to poetry that was not present in other ontologies like uh, CDOC or uh, or whatever uh, it was. So we created the, the ontology for poetry after making an agreement with uh, the different uh, groups working on poetry and we have published uh, everything so we, you can see on the on the website the full ontology published which is of course a, a live project and where we are happy to receive feedback or to enrich it with uh, control vocabularies or with categories because as you know semantic web is always growing and, and trying to enrich and reuse so what we saw at the beginning of the project is that there was a gap in terms of poetry and semantic web. And we try to start working on that. And after that, we become aware of uh, the needs of connecting NLP and our technologies with semantic web in order to make something that could be useful for people in order to, to be able to work on poetry in a, let's say, full way. Thank you. Thanks again for um, a nice lecture, Elena.